Hello. How is everyone? I hope that, uh, music was interesting. Hopefully Twitch doesn't yell at me for playing some, but I thought it would make a better buffer than just the quiet starting soon stream. Um, I also figured it would be helpful to do that for a little bit and give people time to come in. Um, as I know this notification probably takes a while to go out. Um, for those of you who are following me, if you're not, please do so you get notified whenever we go live. Oops. So, welcome back to another stream for Android Study Guide, this project you see here on screen. I'm going to go ahead and drop a link to that in the chat. Uh, for those of you who might be tuning in for the very first time, we are building an Android app live on stream. Uh, for a study guide that will allow our users to see Android development articles and other resources that they can learn from and serve a dual purpose of both learning together while we build something and then building something that we can learn from. Um, so there's a link in chat to the project. If you forget it later, you can always do exclamation point GitHub in the chat. Uh, you can also find it in the channel description on Twitch. Um, and then those of you who have been here before know that I like to handle um, anonymous questions throughout the stream. Um, you know, I'm always happy to take them in chat too, uh, but if you're like afraid to ask questions or it's a little uh, harder to type out, you can do exclamation point slido and you will get the um, up-to-date link from Nightbot for the anonymous questions link. Um, so do that. If you lose it, you can also go to the GitHub project and inside the readme I've broken down each stream uh, with a link to the questions, as well as put the recording here later, any resources we talked about. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, we'll see. Uh, fewer users, uh, or fewer viewers than last week. Um, people are probably, probably busy this week, uh, but that's no big deal. So the purpose of today's stream, what I want to go over, is um, and just a little update for anyone who is tuning in for the first time. Uh, this is about how far we've gotten in our little app. So, in the first stream, we went over some project setup, uh, like KT Lint and Detect, some static analysis tools. We set up GitHub Actions, and then last week we started out by building the UI. We basically built this recycler view that can take some list of articles and show it off. And for now, we're just using this in-memory list of articles that I've typed up. That's why these don't really make sense. They don't look like actual Android developer articles. Um, and that's fine. But what happened during last week's stream is we didn't really, because we were focused on the UI and kind of doing this iteratively, we didn't write what I would consider like clean code. Um, all of this code is really inside of our article, inside of our article list fragment class. Sorry. And that's not great because the fragment is just supposed to be our view class. It should only be responsible for taking some data and binding it to the view. In this case, taking a list of articles and dumping that in the recycler view. That's all that it should be responsible for. Uh, but we can see from last week we had to do a few other things. Like we have the view knowing when it's created that we need to request articles. This is not behavior that I think should be inside of the fragment. Um, we also have this little click listener, um, which is kind of belongs in the view because it is a view event, uh, but we can still probably do some uh, this business logic elsewhere. And so this is, I guess, in a minor way. Uh, and one other thing from last week that we are going to talk about, they're loosely related but a little separate, is this fetch articles method. Um, last week we made this synchronous fetch articles method that will just return a list of articles but this isn't a really great long-term approach either because we want this fetch to be asynchronous because in the future we're actually going to be requesting a list of articles from a network or maybe we'll be really good and we could even do it from like a database um, but in any case this should be some sort of background operation and it's not really written to support that um, so I think in today's stream we can talk about all of those things we can clean up some of the code that was inside article list fragment and put that into a better class. Um, or we could, uh, and 
we will go into the article repository and talk about coroutines and how we can um, make that data request happen in the background. Uh, so I hope that sounds interesting. Again, I've dropped the question link in there, so everyone should have it. Um, and you know the Nightbot command to get it if you forgot. Nightbot will also uh, post it every so often, and I love that it seems to always be timed up with when I'm talking about it. It is like magic. Um, so I think there's a, a few more people here now, so I'm just going to turn off notifications on my phone real quick, and we'll dive in to the first part of that, which is getting some of the code that we just talked about outside of our fragment class. Now, the main reason for that, there's a lot of reasons um, why it's really good to I'll get your memes later. I am the meme right now. Um, there's a lot of reasons why it's really good to not turn your fragments into god classes, uh, but one of them that I consider a big reason why I don't do this is for testing. Because a fragment is part of the Android framework, it's not something I can write a pure JVM unit test for. There are tools like Roboelectric which allow me to work around this, um, but I don't really want to do that. I want some of my domain logic to be inside a pure Java or Kotlin class so I can write my JVM unit test for it. And then there's also the really good like architecture concerns on having a separation of concerns so you don't have overly large classes. Um, it becomes easier to swap out individual components. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, um, architecture can be a heated debate in the Android community, or in any engineering community. Um, should I use MVVM, MVI, MVP, MV, blah blah blah. I gave a talk once called MVWTF, uh, because that is where we've gotten to. I should uh, link that. Actually, let me, let me go ahead and promote that real quick, because that's uh, a really good one, and I think that it's actually one of my favorite talks I've ever given, so I'm going to dump that in here. Hi Pixel, thanks for coming by. Um, so if any of you are interested in learning some of the different architecture patterns, the nuances between them, why you might prefer one over the other, definitely check out this talk. Uh, I think it'll be uh, really helpful. But the short answer to all of this is I prefer the architecture pattern MVVM, or Model View View Model. And to talk briefly about what that means is it's basically splitting your app into three components. You have a model component, which is just responsible for requesting data. And again, that could be requested from anywhere, could be an in-memory list, could be a remote server, a database, or any combination of these. But your model component is just responsible for getting the data. It shouldn't really worry about like validation or you know tweaking that data to how it's displayed on the UI. It should just be like straight up requesting, saving data, anything like that. You have your view class, which is responsible for displaying data. And we can also say like handling click events, at least on Android, where the view is something you interact with. And it should be that simple. So, like I talked about in the beginning, here our view is interacting with the model and fetching information, and it shouldn't do that. It should just know when I receive some information, I need to display it on the UI, but it should not matter like where that information comes from or how it comes in. Um, and then you have the, your view model, which will do everything else. It is kind of the uh, connection between your view and your model and it will do any of your domain logic, like if it needs to validate data, um, if it needs to map the data from your data source to something that the UI can see, um, you know, managing the loading content error states, that's the sort of thing that should exist inside your view model. And as your apps get more complex, maybe we should take things out of our view model, and so that class doesn't get really large. But that's the short explanation of it and what we're gonna do today. So I'm going to start by creating one of those for our article list page, and I'm going to call it article list view model. And this is the segue into an interesting conversation in Android, which is that we have an architecture component view model. Let's see if I have that in the app already. I do. Which is, um, it has the same name as view model. So it's very often that we consider them part of the same conversation, that the architecture component view model 
is tied to the model view view model architecture, uh, but they're not strictly one to one. MVVM as a concept is more about you know that flow of data. Uh, one thing that makes it interesting is the view model doesn't actually know anything about the view. It just exposes some information, and we'll show how we do that in a second. And the view is the one who can consume that information, but the view model doesn't really know who's listening. It just posts out some information and lets someone else subscribe to that information and do something with it. Um, the architecture component view model was a does a lot of things, but a main help from Android was that it helps save data across life cycles. So many of us know that when we take an Android phone and we rotate it, our activity is recreated, and so if we're not careful we have to fetch data a second time. And it used to be that we'd have to go ahead and take the data, store it in a bundle, you know, when the activity is recreated we try to read from this bundle. Uh, with ViewModel we kind of just get that for free. And we'll show, like, in practice how this works. Um, but now that we've created a view model, let's first show how we can um, expose that data. So we could expose it through any number of, um, you know, public variables. But I'm going to use something called live data. And I'm just going to expose a list of articles for now, which will be a live data that is a type list article. And a live data is basically um, an observable data type from Android that um, is lifecycle aware. So a lot of those lifecycle concerns I just mentioned, you know, if you are subscribing to something, if you're using the observable pattern, like Mocker pointed out, you need to clean up those uh, subscriptions when your lifecycle is restarted so that you are not leaking memory references. Live data helps take care of all of that for us. And when we get back to the fragment and show how to consume this live data, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. Now one way we can expose a live data is we can just like create like a mutable live data um, behind the scenes here. But this isn't really... This article sign lo signature looks like it, but this really isn't great because we don't want consumers of articles to be able to manipulate them. We just want them to actually be able to consume it. So one common pattern that people use to work around this is we'll create a private um, live data that this class can manage, and that will be a mutable live data. Mutable, whoops, live data list article. And then what we can do is we can say articles is equal to that. Um, because there's polymorphism on the Android side to basically say I can expose a mutable live data as an immutable live data. And this is just in general a good practice so that you know outside classes can't manipulate the articles under the hood. Only this class can manipulate articles by using that private variable. So now we've defined the information we're going to expose from this view model. The next thing we need to do is figure out how this view model is actually going to request that data. So we can do that by going into our view models constructor, and we'll have it take in an article repository. And that is a class we made last week, which shows how to request data um, for a list of articles, and we can give it some specific article repository based on where that information is coming from but this class just needs to consume that interface. And we will, inside the init method for the view model, we basically say, you know, um, get our fetched articles. Repository.fetch articles. And then we can say articles.setValue equals fetched articles. So what this will do when the view model is initialized is it will request the articles from the repository, push them out into our live data, and then the view can now subscribe to that. And that's it for now. I mean, this is a, a um, small view model for sure. That just requests some data and exposes it. And this is still a very incremental approach to the project because um, as we go on, we might want to expose a more specific view state 
we will want a loading state. We will want a potentially error state. Maybe we want a specific empty state if I'm unable to find articles. So this is, again, an iterative approach. Uh, we'll keep working on this. But we've created our view model. It knows how to fetch some articles, so let's go ahead and use this in our fragment now. Go back to article list fragment. Now to create a view model inside Android, um, especially one that takes in, why can't you do articles that value equals repo that fetch articles? Um, I could, I could, uh, I could inline these two. Uh, that was me just splitting it up for clarity for the chat. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely just like take this, and uh, yeah, you could you could do this. I was just splitting it up for for chat. But yeah, I get that that's weird. Um, so when you're using an architecture components view model that um, takes in some constructor arguments, we need to create a view model factory. So let's create that first. We will call this um, article list view model factory. It will be an object. This will this is basically Kotlin's way of making an anonymous class saying and creating a view model factory on the fly. I think it's view model provider dot factory. Yes, and I need to um, implement a method called create. Now, one thing I don't know if you caught that uh, that was my first big keyboard shortcut. Um, but in case I forget to call it out here, I did control I to implement, um, and that should pop up at the bottom of your screen to show you the keyboard shortcut that I used. Um, but if you catch an action that you're not sure of and you want to know how I did it, let me know. I'm happy to bring that up. Um, there's so many great Android Studio shortcuts. Uh, I, people have given conference talks on this idea alone, which is really cool. Um, so we're going to override this create method. And what we're going to do is we'll define all of the arguments. So in this case, I'm going to say the repository, which is an article repository, is equal to our in-memory article service, kind of like this line you see below. Um, and now this also is a little weird that I'm still in a scenario where the view is aware of what the dependencies are. It's a little better, but it's still not great. Um, and maybe in a future stream we can talk about dependency injection solutions. Um, but we'll let that go for now. So then we're going to return an article list view model and its article repository is equal to the repository I just created. And then this is the weird thing with view model factories is they're generic. So even though we're creating an article list view model, we have to throw this as T at the end. And then usually what I do is uh, option enter to get some information and I can just suppress it for this statement so the yellow line goes away. Um, and again, some people are opinionated about whether or not this belongs in the fragment. I'm going to put it here for now, uh, but I definitely agree. Like We can clean this up and definitely think a future stream could be around dependency injection. It's really interesting but complicated topic, but we'll we'll take those baby steps, uh, work on it incrementally. So now that we've got the view model factory, uh, we can delete this article repository. We're not going to use it anymore, and we're going to override um, on create of the fragment. One thing I forgot to do before I do that is no, we're not going to use dagger. I can promise you, we're not going to use it. Uh, is we also need a reference to the view model for this fragment. So similar to these things up here, we'll make it a latent var for view model and it'll be an article list view model. So now inside on create, when the fragment is created, that's when we're going to want to instantiate our view model. We can do that by calling view model providers. Is it Oh, they changed this. Did y'all hear that thunder? It is thundering. Um, the store owner will be this, the fragment, and then we will give it the... Of course you heard the, fr the thunder, Prince. You live here. Like, get out of here. <laughs> um, and then, okay, so we create a view model provider. <laughs> uh, 
give it the owner, which is this fragment, we give it our viewmodel factory, and then we need to call dot .git and give it our viewmodel class. And this is just kind of, um, let's move this, uh, I guess boilerplate of things that I'm used to copying over and over with viewmodels. Um, I think under the hood this basically just keeps a map of all of the viewmodels you've created. Um, so the this is saying the view model is scoped to this fragment, and so if the fragment is recreated, what this will do is check if a view model already exists for this fragment, and if it does, we'll use that. Otherwise, it will make a new one. Thank you for the follow, Pixel. Uh, great name for coming to an Android stream, by the way. Definitely approve of that. Um, I say as someone who has owned all four generations of the Pixel phone. <laughs> so I'll actually show you once we add this, like, uh, in action what we get out of the view model, which is pretty cool. Um, so what do we do now? We've created our view model, we've created the factory, we've instantiated the view model. Uh, the next thing we need to do is... I'll get to that question in one sec, Kemp. Um, the next thing we need to do with the view model is now change this um, on view created where we are no longer fetching the articles ourselves. What we're gonna do is Inside on view created, um, let's make a new method called subscribe to view model. Just for clarity, create a method called subscribe to view model, and what we'll do is we'll say view model dot articles, which is the live data that we made earlier, and then we call dot observe. We give it a lifecycle owner, which is through the property called view lifecycle owner, which will basically ensure that this obs this observer is tied to this lifecycle, so it will clean up that observer for me and not leak any references. And then we'll give it an observer lambda for what to do when we get new articles. In this case, we could say uh, adapter.articles equals articles. So let's run this real quick. Um, Control D. Will that work? Why is my debug button disappeared? Um, let's try this. Usually there's a debug button up here, and it's gone. What's going on? Let's close the emulator. Classic Android. Um, so my approach for DI, um, is really... I do need to debug the debugger. What is happening? Do I, what if I change my thing? And if I hit Control D, nothing is happening. All right, we're gonna restart Android Studio because that works. And I have a question to answer, so I can talk about it while I do this. Um, yeah. So, all right. There's two. Interesting. Oops. Oh God. Um. So the question about my approach for DI. Um, I've seen Coin, and I think it looks interesting. Uh, but really, I prefer a do-it-yourself approach, which I learned from uh, Sam Edwards' talk, which I can link. Um, that is something that I think is really interesting, because when I look at some libraries, like Coin and Dagger, like they, they do good things, but they're really kind of magical. You look at them and you don't really know where dependencies are coming from, which I understand conceptually that's the point. Like, I don't care where my dependency comes from, I just know that I need this thing. Uh, but I can find that really hard to, like, uh, just read and follow as a developer. But there are some really unique do-it-yourself approaches that give you all of those benefits um, without the magic of, like, using generated code. Um, I think it would be cool on the stream to, like, explore a few options, because I'm definitely very opinionated about that. Um, Hilt is the new big thing that uh, everyone I follow on Twitter really likes, but I haven't tried it yet because I've been very anti-dagger in the past. Um, but I can actually pull up the uh, Sam Edwards talk if you all want to see it. DIY, as you can see, I've looked it up before. Um, so this is really good. This is uh, an approach that I've taken on uh, a couple of my projects. So let me dump that in here. I'll throw this in the resources of the GitHub repo too, since we talked about it. Um, but definitely within the coming weeks, we will do a like dependency injection specific stream. So uh, give me a follow here and or on Twitter and you'll be notified when that comes up. 
Alright, this looks like it worked. That is how you get a follow. That was, that's how you do it. Um, Alright, I hit debug. And where's the emulator? It's on this screen. And I've got, um... Nice. And I've got a few anonymous questions I'll get to in a second, but what I'm doing right now with this emulator is I'm just running changes to our app to make sure we still get uh, the list of articles that we expect. One other thing I'm doing in the meantime is I've been writing all this code off of our development branch. I did make an issue in the project for this view model, issue number six. So I'm gonna go ahead real quick and make a new branch uh, for this code. Git checkout. Now, if you guys missed last stream, I shared a small part of my process, which is um, coming up with branch names that are specific to the issue and feature. So I typically do like an identifier for the project plus the issue number and then a slash and some information. Um, in this case, article list view model. And we need to do a git add on this file. Git add. Alright, and our app is still working. So all of that changed to move some code out of the fragment into the view model worked. So let's commit that code. Um, adding article list view model. And I have a few questions on Slido that I'll go ahead and answer real quick before we move on from here. So one of the questions I got was, how does the view model internally handle surviving config changes? Is it a retained fragment? So I can answer the second part. It is not a retained fragment. Um, so typically what can happen in Android, um, by default I believe, is if I have an activity with a fragment inside and I rotate the phone, it recreates the activity and all of the fragments inside of it. There used to be a solution I believe where you could like call set retain instance to true and what Android would do is not kill the fragment entirely. Um, I don't think that's what happens with view model. I think it takes the view model reference and it stores it somewhere, somewhere that will survive the config changes. And I don't really know the under workings of that very well, but then what will happen is when the fragment is recreated, and specifically when I call this line here with the view model provider, it will check to see if one already exists. Um, and let's look at, uh, what that means. So let's go into our view model class real quick and um, I'm gonna put a log statement here. Log .d. Um, and I'm just gonna say fetching articles. I'm gonna log this one statement whenever I fetch articles and what I'm gonna show you is that as I oops uh, I think that's a idea. Let's run this. But as I rotate the device, we should see that this log only happens once. So there it was once when I fetched the articles. So we'll allow rotation changes. We will rotate this phone. It was recreated. But we notice here in our logs, we still only fetched articles once. So it's maintaining that state, and that's one thing we get from live data as well, is it retains its value. So even though the fragment entirely was recreated, and we could add some logging if you want to see that too, uh, it resubscribes to that view model and that live data, and it gets what was already there. So I didn't have to save the state myself, I didn't have to reread the state myself. Um, that was the beauty of the architecture components view model. Um, it looks so simple. I uh, sometimes forget how different that was in the older days of Android. So I'm really appreciative of the Google team for giving us that. 
and I said the G word, and now my phone is lighting up and yelling at me. Classic. Uh -huh. So, let's, um, let's move on from there. So one other thing I think we could clean up from this uh, fragment is this click listener. Um, but typically what a good architecture approach would be here, because I am doing some domain logic in here, is like take an event from the adapter, push it off to the view model, and then the view model would then emit something to say like navigate to this URI. Um, I'm gonna leave that out for now, maybe we'll do that in a future stream. Uh, this isn't the worst code we could write, uh, but we'll leave it in here for now. It did have one other question, I'm sorry, uh, person who asked it. Is it possible to use view models property delegate with arguments? Um, I'm not sure what that's in reference to. I think that's in reference to some uh, KTX Android uh, Kotlin extensions method around view model. Uh, because I think I have seen things like, um, let me comment this out. I think you can do something like this. I'm not sure if this is what they're referring to. Um, is it, you can do like buy view models and then give it the factory something. I don't remember the code. I'm going to break this up. Uh, I know there's some KTX stuff around view models that makes the code a little cleaner than what I have, uh, but I don't know it thoroughly enough to answer your question, whoever asked about the property delegates. Um, but as I'll always say, like follow up with me on Twitter um, and or during my next stream, and I'm happy to continue digging into these questions if I don't know the answer right away. Um, yes, also what Mocker said, uh, some people just give up on screen rotation. Um, which is, like, weirdly understandable, because I don't think users really use landscape mode ever. Um, I know with the OkCupid okay app, we just have decided to force portrait because not enough people use landscape for us to really invest our time in supporting it. Um, so we just leave everything in portrait, uh, which some people do. Uh, but it's good to know how to do these things, especially because configuration changes now are so much further than opening your Galaxy Fold. That is a configuration change. Um, so it's important to know, even if you're not worried about portrait to landscape, um, even doing something like changing the locale on your phone, changing it to a different language, I think can refresh uh, an activity. Um, so it's good to know like how to keep some of this stuff. So I think that's what I wanted to show you for the view model for now. So let's go over and we'll make a pull request on that. Uh, we'll make this fixes number six uh, because that will automatically close it when I'm done. We'll create the pull request and I will let that run for a second. Oh, that's actually already run because I pushed, so. It's good to know how to do it so you can avoid doing it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's squash and merge this. I didn't actually use that fixes right, so this is still here. Um, so we're gonna mark that as closed check and see if there's any other questions. So the next thing I'm going to do, um, now that we have our data inside this article list view model, I want to tweak the um, data request to be um, able to be done on a coroutine. Uh, but are there any questions about the view model or any of that that I just did before I move on to that? Um, just give me a moment while I switch branches here. Uh, I'll give you a second to post them in chat, post them on Slido. Um, now I'm going to move to number seven.
Um, and also let me know if I figured switching Git branches is like, mm, I've just kind of been doing it. Uh, but please let me know if I trip any of you up or if you want to understand what I'm typing in the terminal. Um, there are like less um, complex ways of changing Git branches, but that's just what I'm familiar with and it's not the heart of what I want to share with everyone, so I kind of gloss over it, but stop me on anything I do if it's confusing. I think we're good to change this. So, this article repository, this fetch articles method is a synchronous function. It's going to be called on whatever thread it's invoked from, and it's going to run on that thread. And so when we get to a point where we actually want these articles to come from a remote data source, uh, we need to do that off the main thread, or we'll get our networking and main thread exception. Um, similar with database operations, or really an, any long-running process. You don't want to do that on your main thread. And a great solution to this uh, that's come first party from the Kotlin team is coroutines, which is a language feature for um, doing concurrency within Kotlin. And there's some information here. I'll go ahead and dump this in chat. Uh, it's, you know, the new buzzword. Everyone used to use RX Java for all of their asynchronous work on Android. Still many people do. It's something I'm very familiar with. Um, but a complaint you would hear about RX Java many times is just that it was too large of a tool for what it was being used for. RX Java is a really large library that does so much great asynchronous work and data streams. Um, but often when all we're doing is making a network, requ network request, I want to run this on the background thread, be notified when I get some information back. RxJava does so much more than that one use case. And coroutines offer us a way to do um, non-blocking tasks, but in a way that also reads synchronously, uh, which is really helpful. And as we write it, you'll see that it doesn't feel like we're doing complicated asynchronous code, uh, but we will be. And so the first thing I'm going to do is somewhere in here, I need the dependency if I don't have it already. Um, let's see if I can find this. Coroutines Android dependency. Steal it from GitHub. There we go. So we're going to steal this Android module. This gives us some information. Uh, and like, this is basically the core coroutines library with some information on, um, like the main thread dispatcher for Android. We'll talk about a dispatcher in a second. But let's go ahead to our build.gradle file and dump in this implementation and sync this to get coroutines. Now the first thing we're going to do to make a coroutine is inside our article repository to specify that a function needs to be run inside a big coroutine, uh, which you can think of as a lightweight thread. Um, so anything that needs to run like that, we just mark it with the keyword suspend. And now, just by doing that, we'll get this compile time alert um, that we are trying to call a suspend function uh, synchronously. And so it will give us an error saying, Suspend function fetch articles should be called only from a coroutine or another suspend function. So we need to create a coroutine. We need to create one of these lightweight threads to go ahead and run this in the background for us. And how do we do that? Well, I could walk you through the sort of historical context of creating a coroutine, but I'll just jump to um, the great way to do it in Android now, uh, which is referencing this property called viewmodelscope, which is an extension function that comes from the KTX library, and we just call viewmodelscope.launch, and this will go ahead and launch a coroutine that is scoped to this viewmodel. And what I mean by that is, because this is like another thread, 
that's running, and it is going to need to be cleaned up eventually, so we're not leaving this reference running. And what this will do is, Android will automatically, when this view model is cleared, also clear up any coroutines associated with it. So I don't have to do that management myself, which is really nice that it gives us this helper function. So we're going to launch this view model, or launch this coroutine inside the view model. We can then say our articles are equal to article repository dot fetch articles, and then articles dot value equals articles. Actually, that's that's probably again. I'm gonna shift function F6 to rename this. We'll call it fetched articles again, uh, just to clean that up, and we'll delete this code. So now we have something that is going to create a coroutine, run this data request um, in the background, and not block the UI thread. Now it's a little weird because by default this launch is going to launch a coroutine on the main thread, which is, depending on what you do, it might be a non-blocking thing, but this could still block the main thread. So how do we get around that? Well, we can look at this line right here, fetched articles. This is what we want to guarantee doesn't run on the main thread. And so within a coroutine, we can actually switch context, switch threads. And we can say with context, whoops, with context dispatchers, which is like a, um, how do I describe a dispatcher? It's a way of defining the thread that a coroutine should be running on. There's these three. Um, there's main, which is the main thread. IO, which is like a special dispatcher for doing um, input-output operations. And then unconfined will basically inherit uh, from whatever thread that it's already on. This is helpful um, in unit tests, which maybe we'll show today if we get to it. Uh, but here we're going to do with context dispatchers.io and then we're going to, whoops, let's do this. We call fetched articles, whoops, well, sorry, words. So we can't just do this because now fetched articles can't be referenced below. So we'll take that assignment and we can actually assign uh, this result of with context. So this is saying that, you know, we're gonna switch to another thread to compute this value. When I'm done, we'll return it, assign it to fetched articles, and then I can display it on the UI. And so for those of you who are familiar with RxJava, um, you notice this is very different than some of the asynchronous code you might be used to seeing. Um, if this is your first time looking at code that is asynchronous, you might notice that it doesn't look like it's asynchronous. I can read this line by line, and everywhere that it suspends in the background and waits is just kind of handled by the language, and I don't really have to see that in code. And that makes this a lot easier for me to read. And I can see with this suspend um, image on um, the gutter of the IDE, you know, where that suspension is happening or could be happening. Um, so that's really nice. So let's go ahead and commit this code real quick. I'm adding, whoops, whoops, whoa, whoa, whoa. Converting fetch articles to a coroutine. And then we're going to uh, run this real quick to make sure I didn't break anything. Oop, I broke something, ah. So now that I changed the method signature in the interface, I need to add, update the method signature in the implementation. And I just pushed code that's going to break. Nice. Um, that's what the continuous integration is for. and I did it live. Cool, so our app still works, even though we're requesting data on the background. And again, since this doesn't look like it, um, 
let me show you some logs uh, to demonstrate that. So let's. I should really add Timber, which is a great logger. Um, but now we're going to say. So we're going to log right here. We're going to say um, setting articles on thread. And then we're going to call thread dot current thread dot get name or dot name so all this is going to do is print into our output um, the thread we're on I'm going to log one right here too I'm going to say setting article we're going to call fetching articles on thread and I'm going to put one more at the top uh, and say starting coroutine on thread and I just want to do this to demonstrate um, in logging uh, what this is doing because it looks like magic and it is all programming is magic at the end of the day we um, but just so you can see in logging uh, what that actually looks like log cat so we can see it right in the logs what just happened we started a coroutine on the main thread when we called with context we switched to a new one and that's what did our data operation, which was fetching those articles. And then we went back to the main thread to set them on our live data. Yeah, we make a piece of rock do what we want. Um, one time at my last job, uh, this project manager was talking about something. And they were basically, some website, and they were basically like, Oh, well, I just hit a bunch of buttons until it did what I wanted. And I said, well, that's how I do my job. And they didn't th find that very funny, um, but it's accurate. <laughs> Just clicking buttons until it does what I wanted to. Um, so I hope that's helpful in understanding what a coroutine is doing. Uh, so let's go ahead and get rid of those log statements. Uh, maybe I should have left them uh, for other people who want to look at this. Maybe we'll add them back. Um, fixing. Uh, what did I do? Fixing suspend. Um, override. And I had a couple anonymous questions to answer real quick, which is good. Um, are there any dis one question I've got is, are there any disposing of the live data that one needs to do when the activity is destroyed? So the short answer to that is no. And that's the uh, beauty of live data is um, when I observe the live data and I tell it, you know, this view lifecycle owner, is the owner to use that Android will know to tie this observer to that life cycle and so when that life cycle ends um, however it ends Android will clean up that subscription for me so I don't have to keep note of it myself which is really nice um, it's important to understand like conceptually that that happens that you don't want to maintain a reference to something longer than you need it. Um, and that can be a danger of seeing this code all the time, is I can forget that concept. Um, but when I do it this way, um, I don't have to worry about that happening. And that's the same thing that happens inside our view model when we say view model scope launch. So let's imagine that this is making a real network request and it takes five seconds and I fire this up and then I give up and I close my app or I rotate my phone while that's happening um, if this view model is destroyed before the network call completes I could risk a memory leak right um, so I need to know when the view model is cleared to also clear any subscription to these long-running tasks. Um, that is something I would have to do myself, but by using the view model scope provided by Android, it will do it for me. Um, so that's really nice. Like, so yes, we do things do need to be cleaned up, but both in the coroutines and the live data that we've looked at so far, Android does it for us. That was a really good question, though. Um, I feel like someone posed a trick question for me. Uh, what type of job does the vModel scope use? It's different from a normal job and has a special property. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Let's see if we can figure it out. Um, 
So all I did here was I command clicked in the view model scope to read the docs on this. Um, and this explained everything I did. It creates a coroutine scope tied to this view model. It will be cancelled when the view is cleared. I'm not sure what the job is. So a job, for anyone who isn't familiar with that keyword, a job is... Um, how do I describe it? This one in here. Um, they're probably referring to the supervisor job. Uh, but a job is like, let me explain it, it's like, that's what the coroutine is bound to. So if I wasn't using view model scope, I would have to define a job, and when I create, when I launch a coroutine, it gives me back a job, which is a reference to that coroutine operation. And then, yeah, it's like a process, I guess. And so when I want to cancel the coroutine, really what I do is I cancel the job that it's associated with. Um, so I think, so with that, I think what this is saying that a supervisor job is different of, um, oh, interesting, um, shows how much I know about operating systems. So I'm looking at this line of the documentation on supervisor job. And I think this might be the trick question that I got, uh, which is that children of a supervisor job can fail independently of each other. Um, and why that might be important is if, um, is it implies that otherwise, if I have a job and several coroutines associated with it, and one of them fails, this makes it sound like they would all fail. Um, but in some cases I might not want that. I might want to let things fail individually. You know, if I'm making two network requests, uh, I should be fine if one errors out, but one doesn't. Um, I think that is the high level uh, explanation, um, but definitely uh, someone let me know if that doesn't seem right, or feel free to dig more into this. Um. <laughs> Sam, it is late. No one should be working right now. <laughs> uh -huh. that, that was a really good question, too. Um, and there's another question in here on showing the equivalent Java code of the suspending function and why it adds continuation to the fetch articles method print. Um, that might be interesting for a deeper dive into coroutines. Um, I'm going to bookmark this question, actually, um, to show like a Java equivalent of this, but I'm not going to go there today. I'm not ready to do that on the fly. Uh, so let's talk one other thing I would change about this coroutine. Thank you for all the anonymous questions, by the way. I like can't stress that enough. I love that I get so many of them. Um, so one other thing on this coroutine right here is inside our view model, we know that like fetch articles should be run on the IO thread, um, but I would prefer my view model to not really like care about that. I want it to just be able to fetch articles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, that with context concept and I'm going to instead use that like at the call site where I need it. So what I mean by that is I'm going to go into fetch articles inside of our in-memory article service. And I'm going to take this list, just going to cut this real quick, and I'm going to put my return with, with context inside of this um, class so that the view model doesn't need to worry about changing threads, uh, but this method specifically, this method knows that it should run on a different thread, so we're going to put that here, dispatches.io, and then we'll paste that static article list. Thanks. Um, and it's like, I don't know if this is considered a hack, um, because I'm just moving code around, and it's more of a personal preference on where it belongs. Um, but one reason I would argue that I like this more is because, let's say I was writing this in some sort of larger coroutine code base that other people could be referencing. Um, if I know that this method needs to be run on another thread, then I should do it myself because people don't read the manual, and so someone will then go into their view model, they will call it like this, not realizing that I didn't switch threads, 
and they're not going to remember to switch threads, and this might end up being run on the main thread, and if it's a really really long one, this could actually block the main thread, even if coroutines are main safe, it can happen. Um, so by being the owner of this code that I know should run, um, blog post, yeah that's great, that's great, I'm going to do that. Um, uh, now I gotta go fast, because the whole world uh, is gonna steal my idea now. But I think it is nice if the actual implementation of this method goes ahead and does it, um, so that I don't have to worry about the call sites. And one last thing I would change about this piece of code here is, you know, this dispatcher's I.O. Um, I'm gonna want that most of the time, but maybe not always if I was unit testing this. Um, maybe I don't really want to switch threads because I'm unit testing. So a quick way to support that is um, I'm going to give the option for this article service to take in uh, what dispatcher it should run on. So I'm going to define a parameter called IO dispatcher. It will be a coroutine dispatcher and I will give it a default value of dispatchers.io. But what this allows me to do is inside unit tests um, I can give it a different coroutine. Um, Sam, you missed it earlier. I actually plugged your talk today um, because we talked about dependency injection and I said that I am a huge fan of do-it-yourself dependency injection after seeing your talk at Android Summit. In the future, I'm probably going to do a stream and talk about that a little bit. I'd love like for you to come hang out uh, and share that because everything I would say I learned from you, basically. And that's true about most of my Android development, if we're honest, but I try to take some credit. Um, <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, push this up. Moving with context into in memory articles. Ah, oh, thanks. So cool. What time is it? How are we doing on time? All right, we've we've streamed for about an hour today, which is pretty good. Um, and that's mostly what I wanted to cover. Uh, I'll see if there are other questions. What I could also do today is talk a little bit about testing. Um, we could write a unit test around this fetch articles method. Um, who knows, maybe I'll save testing for another time because I could really get into it. Um, see if there's other good questions. Um, haha! Somebody asked me a question on should the dispatcher be injected into the repository? and I saw that coming, and I did it without even thinking about it. Um, so it was great. Um, if someone, this is a good question, if someone is using retrofit to get articles, does it, sus does it support suspending functions? Yes. So as of retrofit 2 dot something, uh, coroutines are like built-in support in retrofit, um, so you can write suspending functions. I actually think, um, so this week I'm going to switch up the schedule a little bit. Uh, Y'all are first to hear this, but on Saturday I would like to do a stream probably around noon Eastern time so I could get some of my European friends to hang out. And I think on Saturday we're going to actually uh, plug in Retrofit and hit the RSS feed for um, my Android Essence blog and show some real Android articles inside the app. Uh, so definitely come hang out to that. Yeah, two dot something. That that compiles, right? Um, and uh, Sam, someone would like to know if you're gonna do a uh, handstands uh, Twitch stream. They they would like to watch you do some handstands. Um, is that? Didn't you give a? Uh, a talk on well called how to do a handstand where you related learning a handstand to learning android development no that didn't happen all right I, i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm lying to y'all didn't happen didn't happen uh, <laughs> cool um i'm trying to decide if i want to go down this testing rabbit hole or if i want to call it a short stream for tonight does anyone really want to see some testing? Does anyone want to see me do anything else with the view model or coroutines or anything? I feel like in the hour. Next time. Nice. So I'm happy to keep chatting if there's any, like, just follow-up questions, because 
I'll, I'll write the blog post. I'll write the blog post. Uh, I mean, I should write the blog post because I can just continue to capitalize on, like, GDE activities when I do this. If I stream and blog about every stream, then I just, like, get to log two things and I'm gonna look hella productive. <laughs> uh, this is so much fun. Thank you guys for coming. I was, like, stressed about this for a while. My friend Tristan, who is not here tonight, um, has probably been telling me to stream for at least a year, as has Prince. Yeah, you know, Prince is always telling me. Yes. Of course, and this is open source, so make sure you go up, up, we are not in Twitch chat. Um, make sure if y'all haven't given this a star, that you please do. Um, and let's go ahead, I guess while we're, while we're talking, and we'll, uh, do a new poll request for the article coroutine. For article. We'll create that, make sure, nice, that passed. So, yeah, it passes really fast because there are not unit tests, um, but definitely, probably next week, because I really want to do the retrofit uh, stream on Saturday, uh, but maybe next Wednesday we can talk about um, some testing. Yeah, again, thank you all for... Um, Oh, I got one other question. Um, print out the coroutine's context. What's in there in addition to the dispatcher? It's an interesting question. Um, can I access that? Uh, let's let's do this. Let's hit a breakpoint and let's look at that. Uh, Cause I'm curious what that that question is. Um, sorry, I mumbled the question, but the question was, um, you know, just information about the coroutine's context. So, let's, uh, we can do that. So, I'll show you another cool Android Studio trick. Um, a blog about coroutine context? Hmm. Let's check it out. So, one thing about the Android Studio debugger, if you're not familiar, is this icon right here, which is Evaluate Expression, allows you to kind of write some code that's going to be executed uh, right now while we're debugging. So I can actually call coroutine context uh, right inside uh, of here, and I hit Evaluate, and it will give me some information about it, um, where it looks like it gives me the dispatcher, you can tell me the handler that it's running on, give me a continuation key, um, I wonder what left is. Um, yeah, I feel like there's, um, a deeper question in the slidey link, uh, but maybe, maybe not, um, Karima, Jane, oh yeah, yeah, they, they do some great, uh, talks and stuff. Um, did we merge this? We did. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to our uh, development branch. And we'll close this issue now that this is done. So the issues are just kind of for me to keep myself organized with each stream. I'll give Sam a second to... Yeah, I'm sorry about the uh, questions I'm getting about the coroutine context. If you want to reach out to me separately and let me know a little bit about what you're getting into, I can, happen t I can uh, follow up on that in the next stream. Uh, but I'm not really sure where we're digging into in the coroutines. There's a lot to learn about coroutines. I showed you a very um, introductory approach to them on how to make a one-off data request using coroutines, um, but they can do more complicated work. There's also a whole nother level of coroutines, which is flow, which is Kotlin's reactive stream approach. Um, maybe that's saved for a future stream as well. Um,
I wonder if, um, give me one second. I think I might know, um, one second. I, uh, just messaged someone because I think I might know who Sam is referring to, uh, but I'm not sure what post they're referring to. Um, let's see if the person's around to answer my question. Doesn't look like they're online right now. Um. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up on that. So I've been um, putting at the end of each stream a list of like resources um, that are relevant to the conversations. So if we can figure out who that is, even if it's not like right now, I can go ahead and dump it in this resources section. Um, and I'll happily talk about it uh, on Saturday or next Wednesday even. Um. Cool. Hmm. All right. Is there any others um, about what we did today? A random Android questions, or because uh, I'm always happy to answer those too. Like I am trying to keep the stream going with a sort of uh, focus on building the study guide app, uh, but I'm always happy to talk about uh, broader Android things. If there are specific Android topics you want to learn about uh, live, let me know. I can um, do those. Uh, Things. Let's see. Oh, hey, this opened up. Hey, Sam, is this the post that you were talking about? Um, small world. Mm. Ah, it's a different one. Uh, well, everyone should go read this anyways, because... Um, Mohit is a fantastic writer and someone I have learned a lot of uh, co-routine and flow work from, um, especially because I will tinker with stuff like on the weekends and I'll message Mohit on the middle of the day on Sunday and say, I don't understand flows. Um, and he is always incredibly kind and takes time out to help me understand them. Uh, can't thank him enough. So definitely check out this post. Um, what don't I like about coin? Well, I haven't really used coin in a project to have a, um, a rational uh, opinion on it, um, but what I think of a lot of DIY thing or DI dependency injection uh, frameworks, um, and what I like differently about the approach that Sam has talked about is just like it can feel very magical. Uh, you're just kind of writing a lot of code and you don't really know where things are coming from. And as I said earlier, like in some ways that's the point. Uh, you know, when I have a class that needs some dependencies, I shouldn't care where they come from. I just need these things. Um, but I like to be able to understand how my code is flowing and where things are being created and how they're being passed around. Um, so, but I think, like, maybe it would be fun to do a stream on where we look at, like, three popular dependency injection approaches, like, all in one stream, uh, just to play around with each of them and talk about like what we liked and didn't like about each one. Um, I think it could be a fun thing to do um, and give me an excuse to actually try things because, you know, like most engineers, I'm kind of shitting on things that I don't use regularly uh, to have a strong enough opinion about them. Um, but yeah, I'll actually, yeah, I like that. Maybe we'll, um, because I want to do the retrofit stream on Saturday. Um, and next week I was ideally thinking about testing. Um, but then maybe right after that we can go on to dependency injection. Um, but then we'll be pretty close to uh, building something we could even talk about publishing to the Play Store. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm like perfectly okay with getting a point where it's pulling the um, articles from my blog post and then taking them and... Uh, <laughs> like, putting that to the Play Store, um, but it would be cool to get, like, an aggregated source of, uh, different, um, blog posts, so, like, um, not to call out anyone specifically, but if there are people in chat who blog, um, you know who you are, if your blog post has an RSS feed, uh, let me know, uh, if you'd be cool with, like, having it included in this, in this project eventually, um, because it would be really cool to, like, aggregate a bunch of sources, um, and, and get that in here. 
So, whoa. This is long. So this is a class diagram for a coroutine context. This is very thorough. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I can't even, like, blow this up big enough for everyone to see it. Hey, that's not making it bigger. Uh, but thanks for sharing that link, and I'm definitely going to drop that into the um, resources on GitHub uh, if anyone needs to find that later. Do I follow this person? I do. Um, it's got the Jake Warden seal of approval. What else do you need in a tweet? Oh, you can't see that. My picture's covering it. It's got the Jake Warden seal of approval. What else do you need in a tweet, you know? Well, I would give it one, but I feel like I shouldn't respond to a, like, eight-month-old tweet. That would be a little weird. Um, so I'm just gonna let it go. We'll, we'll give it a like. That That's my seal of approval. <laughs> Nick Neelied. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, we should give it a retweet, too. Thanks for sharing that, Sam. Um, yeah, coroutines are really fascinating. Um... I just love how this reads. Um, it's doing the complicated work of running on a background thread, but it reads top to bottom. I can see exactly what's happening, um, which is how it should be. I think someone who is new to programming, I've had this conversation with coroutines before, uh, people who are new to asynchronous programming in Android are going to pick these up a lot faster as someone who has historically worked with things like RxJava or different callback interfaces. It's like, hard to men like flip around that mental model of asynchronous programming to see something that reads like this like to understand how it suspends its process and picks it up later but i don't need to know that that's jetbrain's job i just need to know how to use it so <laughs> cool thanks for chatting um but I think, I think we're good. So I hope you all have enjoyed this. I've been enjoying doing this. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for Saturday. I'll probably tweet some stuff out. Hopefully because it is Saturday, I can uh, get some more people in here. Um, but I kind of like having the small group. I don't freak out as much when I see that there's like five people and I know all five of you. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of weird to think about like the audience when you're streaming because of the fact that, like, it doesn't really matter how many of you there are, because I don't see anyone. I'm still just talking to my webcam at the end of the day. So it really shouldn't matter how many people are on the other side. There's no reason for that to make anyone nervous. But I don't know. I'm a human. That's what it is. So. Alright, well, if there aren't any more for today, um, then I will see you guys uh, on Saturday or on next Wednesday. <laughs>